Well, they're currently running at about 30% of the market, and when you get that high, of course you have to be concerned. What it does is to make you more competitive. There's still a lot of knuckle breaking and stuff like that, but it, it is less than what it was when I first started. Now you have to use, you have to be intelligent, you have to use your brain and your mind. Motoring 91 is brought to you by Quaker State. The big Q stands for quality. Always has, always will. If this looks like a desert, you are right. As a matter of fact, we're in the Coachella Valley in Southern California. We're about an hour's drive out of Palm Springs, and wow, that looked like one of those brand new Acura legends. There goes another one. There must be about 10 or 15 down there. Now, why would there be so many Hondas out here in the middle of the desert? Well, we're here for the 1991 Legend launch. The Legend, of course, uh, was brought out in 1987 in uh, Canada. And we're here to introduce the 91, which is the all-new uh, ground-up uh, car that is replacing the, uh, the previous model. So we'd like to bring the press down here for a nice uh, full day of uh, not only just relaxing, but also putting the cars to a test. The desert is very conducive to a twisty road, and of course uh, we have the nice weather. Not, we'd, we'd certainly love to do it in Canada, but I understand we're having a little snow in the Toronto area. But, uh, yeah, the desert area does uh, lend itself to uh, some very nice twisty bits of road that uh, the car can react to quite nicely and give the uh, the media uh, some good response. Doug, are we cleared for takeoff? It's a thoroughly capable and competent vehicle and I think if Honda was uh, intending to produce a kind of a mid-sized luxury car with some sporting pretensions, I think they've probably done that. Um, the only downside is that it, it, it just lacks a bit of personality, a little character of its own. It's, it does everything capably and very well, but it's not a thrilling car to drive. Do you find that's becoming a trend? Yes, I do. I think that um, you know, the more the engineers try to achieve a kind of perfection in terms of uh, reducing engine sound and damping out the shocks from the road, the further they subtract the driving experience from the driver. And uh, maybe it's time for them to rethink that a bit because I think that you do have to have some feedback from the vehicle in terms of sound and in terms of what's happening through the, the road wheels and so on. What are some of the highlights of the 91 model over the night? Well, the, I think the quietness and the, uh, uh, the luxury feel that you get when you're driving the car, very responsive. Um, I think the people would be uh, very interested in, uh, in looking at the car and driving the car. And I'm going to save a little bit about that to, to let the people go to the showrooms and find out. So Honda is obviously very excited about their brand new legend, and they're hoping that you, the public, will feel the same way. And you know, the public's love affair with a Japanese automobile started in the early 70s with a Honda Civic, and it's grown stronger with every passing year. And it's no secret that that love affair has made some people nervous and others even angry. Okay, I read the research. You know what I think? I think America is getting an inferiority complex about Japan. <laughs> Everything from Japan is perfect. Everything from America is lousy. Two cars come off the same assembly line in the same American plant. Japanese nameplate goes on one, an American nameplate on the other, and people prefer the Japanese version. Now that's got to stop. This is but one of several America's television commercials that starred Lee Iacocca, the man who runs the Chrysler Corporation. Now, although the commercial was criticized by some as being anti-Japanese, bordering on racist, many industry insiders believe that Iacocca was simply echoing the feelings of the domestic automakers. They do not like the trend that has seen imports grab 30% of the market. And this year, Honda could become the first import to sell 100,000 units in Canada. And that's going to change. I think Mr. Iacocca should be very careful in what he says when you consider Mitsubishi is one of their largest selling segments of their product range. Well, they're currently running at about 30% of the market, and when you get that high, of course you have to be concerned. What it does is to make you more competitive. You need to do a better job of designing cars, you need to do a better job of bringing them to market, and uh, just provide cars that are going to be fully competitive with the Japanese. Well, the auto industry is very psychologically driven. The fact of the matter is, is that GM Ford Chrysler product is 
world-class quality. You know, the Japanese probably still have a bit of a quality advantage over the domestics, but all vehicles being purchased today, with the exception of perhaps some oddball ones from Eastern Europe or far, far, far oddball country east, uh, they're all well-made, they're all high quality, and that's the advantage in the marketplace right now. It's a consumer win situation. Uh, I've had um, a Buick and uh, I've had uh Firebird, and uh, I seem to have problems with both of them. The Honda I have now, little Honda Civic, is fantastic. Well, there's no question that over the last decade, people have tried the, the import product. They have, for various reasons, given up on North American product. But we see some evidence uh, of a switch back. When you get 20% of the trade-ins on our new Escort, import cars, then not all import car buyers are completely satisfied. Some of them are switching back. I, um hear from other people, friends of mine, that uh, they're more reliable, less problems, and I think I'll try Japanese one next time. Alex, can this unprecedented growth by the Japanese industry, can the domestic market maybe not stop it, but, but slow it down? Sure. Uh, the domestics are making great cars. Uh, the cars are probably not, uh, haven't crashed the consumer consciousness yet. They're, they're, not, they're still not there, but they're a lot closer than they were even two years ago. And five years ago, it's night and day the difference. They sure they can catch up. Americans just don't understand the quality of our cars. It's obvious that Iacocca was hoping to appeal to American patriotism in this commercial. So the question is, does national fervor play a part when purchasing a car? Our cars are every bit as good as a Japanese. Sir, when you buy your next vehicle, will it be a North American car or a Japanese car, and why? It'll be a North American car. I believe in supporting my own economy. We've got to keep it strong. Probably a North American model. Uh, GM, more than likely. Because uh, I'd rather give the work to the uh, Canadian workers. Oh, I don't think that GM, Ford are threatened as number one and two. Now, Honda is threatening Chrysler for the number three position, uh, certainly in the States, less so in Canada. But then if you take the entire market, car and light truck together, uh, what's a minivan? It's a passenger use vehicle. Uh, Chrysler still is a solid three. Can you see getting even a bigger share of the market? Can you see down the road 20 years from now where you're number two, number one? Well, we, uh, our aim is not the uh, number two or number three or something like that, but uh, we try to, you know, get uh, more customers, that's it. Test Drive with Graham Fletcher. This week on Test Drive, we look at the 1991 NX2000. Now, this is the car that's going to fill the void left by the departure of the very popular Pulsar. Like the Pulsar, the NX has a T-bar roof. During the summer months, it gives you an open-air feel. In winter, it does not suffer from the inherent drawbacks of a ragtop. On the subject of winter, a washer wiper on the rear window is a must because this window attracts dirt like a magnet attracts iron filings. The drivetrain in the NX is an interesting configuration. Firstly, you have a state-of-the-art all-aluminum 2.0-litre 16-valve engine that produces 140 horses and 130 pounds-feet of torque. Pop this into a car that tips the scales at a scant 2,500 pounds and you have a veritable race car. On the skid pad, we took just 7.5 seconds to race through the 100k mark. Matched with this engine is a slick shift in 5-speed that features Nissan's award-winning viscous limited slip differential. In the pylon test, the differential action was not noticeable, and as you might expect, this car tracks a fast line through the course. When we did some track testing with this car, if you push it into a bend and you back off the gas, the car goes into an oversteer condition. This is called trailing throttle oversteer. Now, on the pylon test, it doesn't show up because we run the course at a constant speed. However, on the road, if you push it into a bend and back off the gas, you better be prepared to catch it. The body styling looks as though it was an exercise in the use of a French curve. Everything flows from one curve to another, even down to the oval apertures for the headlights. The overall effect is rather pleasing and certainly more attractive than the angular and rather boxy pulsar. The instrument cluster, which is housed in an oval binnacle, is complete in every respect. It also continues the curved theme. 
Each and every one of the analog gauges gives the driver easy access to the information they contain. The remainder of the driver controls are conveniently located and fall within fingertip reach. Even the power window switches which are housed in the door can be reached with your hands still on the wheel. The dead pedal is well placed but is too short, meaning your toes hang over the end. This becomes uncomfortable if you use it as intended. Aside from that, the car affords a very comfortable driving position. The front seats offer ample support and plenty of legroom for a small car. The back seat, however, is narrow and cramped and is better used for storage. For the most part, I had it folded down. The trunk lip is nicely contoured and so loading and retrieving parcels is a snap. Nissan have done a very good job with the new NX. However, I do have my usual pet peeve and it's to do with the sound that the seatbelt warning buzzer makes. It's very grating and trying to get the seatbelt because it's anchored so far back is awkward. Now to the scoreboard for the verdict on the 1991 NX2000. With 140 horses under the hood, you can attain the 100K mark in just seven and a half seconds. What surprised me was that this can be accomplished in second gear. Pop third and watch out for the police because this engine loves the red line. The NX2000 features a four-wheel disc brake system with an anti-lock feature. Stops from 80 km an hour were achieved in just 112 feet. The NX's suspension is taut and for everyday driving a little stiff, but push the car and it does an admirable job. Sway bars back and front assure a level ride. At 100 km an hour, the NX produces 74 decibels of noise. Most of this can be attributed to the higher than usual RPM the engine turns at this speed. A little noisy, but nonetheless acceptable. During the test, we averaged 29 miles per gallon. Given the gusto, I found this figure quite reasonable. If fast and fun head your list of desirables in your next purchase, the new NX2000 is well worth a look. This car caps off a very busy couple of years for Nissan. One can only wonder how many more new models they can possibly have up their sleeve. We're now in an area known as the Box Canyon, about 40 miles outside of Palm Springs, California. And yes, it's very hot out here. And you know, when you're driving on these desert roads, your thermostat becomes a very important piece of equipment in controlling the temperature of your engine. Well, we're now going to join our chief mechanic, Bill Gardner. And Bill says that the thermostat up north is also very important, especially when the weather gets cold. There's a couple of different faults with thermostats. They usually either stick open or stick closed. Now, if you're in Palm Springs, you'd never know if this was stuck open. But if you're in Canada, boy, you'd have pretty poor performance from your heater and a cold running engine. And that means high exhaust emissions and poor fuel mileage. So it's important to check these regularly, make sure they're working properly. They're not expensive and they're easy to change. So it's something the average owner can handle. The thermostat is usually mounted on the intake manifold or sometimes on the cylinder head of the engine. It's usually a simple matter to remove it. This particular one, only two bolts in the housing, sometimes a hose clamp or a sensor or a wire to disconnect. And we can move aside the housing. We can see the th thermostat just sitting in the intake manifold. Now, when you remove it, you can actually see the coolant in the intake manifold. And it's important that the thermostat is installed with the spring towards the engine so that this sensor core is immersed in the coolant. If the thermostat's in upside down like that, it'll never work properly. And that's a common mistake a lot of do-it-yourselfers make. Now, the action of this thermostat, when it's working properly, it must be closed for the first several minutes of engine operation. And then it has to push itself open against that spring and allow coolant to come out to the radiator once the engine has reached the minimum operating temperature. Then it's up to the radiator con to control the maximum operating temperature once that thermostat has fully opened. So if you're having an overheating problem that takes 20 minutes or half an hour of highway driving to develop, it's probably not the thermostat, it's probably the radiator. Now the most common problem we have here in Canada is thermostats stuck open. That causes poor heater performance. So the thing to do is drain your radiator down several inches so you can see inside the rad car and see the action of the coolant. Start the car on a cold start and have a look and see if that coolant's moving. If, if you see what we're seeing right here now, coolant gushing through the radiator on a cold start, you either don't have a thermostat installed in your car or it's stuck wide open. When you're installing a thermostat, it's important to also look for the bleeder notch. That tiny little notch that you see in there allows air to purge out of the cooling system when you're refilling the radiator. Once you've identified the 
position of that bleeder notch on the thermostat, mark it with a pencil, and if the thermostat's being installed vertically, that must be at 12 o'clock. If it's being installed horizontally, it can go in in any position, as long as you remember, of course, that the spring must be towards the engine coolant. It's also important to remember that the thermostat is an integral part of the emission control system. You'll see a number of sensors clustered around the stat housing, one electrical one in this car and one vacuum operated one and they depend on a minimum operating temperature of the cooling system or they won't function properly. So it's important to have the correct high temp thermostat in that car. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 91. They're telling you, disconnect it. Rerun the test, see if the computer recognizes the fact that you disconnected it. If it does recognize that fact, what's broken? You're looking down on the town of Rancho Mirage, just outside of Palm Springs, California. It's a beautiful sight, isn't it? Well, you know, if you were watching the show last week, and I'm sure you were, then you know we began a series on the mechanic of the 90s. We dropped in on a high school automotive class. Well, this week, Steve Grant discovers that even after graduation, that learning experience continues. Remember when power windows were a big deal? Well, now we have fuel injection, we have ABS brakes, we have active suspension. They're all great technological developments, but sooner or later, they all break down. Now, I wouldn't have a clue how to fix any of these components, but what about my serviceman? How does he keep in touch with the new technology? Well, for many of them, it means getting the books and going back to school. Circuit test B8. Throttle position sensor. No, performance test. When service code 23, 53, 63, or 73 is displayed in quick test. Answer your question about how many times they figure this thing can break, or how many different ways it can break. All right? It looks more like a computer course than auto mechanics, and in a sense, it is. A lot of the technicians in this classroom have been in the trade for over 10 years. But the almighty microchip has changed the automotive repair industry dramatically and larger service centers are left to scramble to keep up to date. Some of these guys, I really feel for them. Uh, they've been in the garages, they're doing a great job, but they're to the point when sometimes they open the hood, if they can't identify half the, half the parts they see, then it's got to be tough. Around here we call that job security. They've got to come and see me. The, the old joke when I entered the industry was, well, if you can't do anything else, become a mechanic. These days, somebody that enters the mechanical field is there because he really wants to be. You don't enter this, this trade on a whim. You have to want to do it. This particular course is five days long. The mechanics come from all over the country, and at the end of the week, they have to pass a test. The classroom is where they catch up on their reading, but it's the garage where they get to put their knowledge to work. I think if most people knew the amount of electronics that was actually in their car and the amount of computer controls that are in there, uh, we wouldn't get half the flack, I guess, that we get in terms of, of repair. If they knew it was there, it's a very scary thought. It's a very scary thought to the people that have to fix them. The consumer today, like, it's not a five-minute job to diagnose something anymore. You get a problem, computerized problem, you get into it, you can be into it for hours trying to figure it out, you know. It's no simple uh, fact as to, well, it's going to be this, it's going to be that. You know, it could be a broken wire, it could be anything. You could be in there for hours looking for it. Is it getting to the point yet where you guys aren't getting your hands dirty? And there's so many computers now and printouts, uh, or is there still a lot of uh, ingenuity involved? Uh, there's still a lot of knuckle breaking and stuff like that, but it, it is less than what it was when I first started. When we first started, it was a lot more bow work and that. Now you have to use, you have to be intelligent. You have to use your brain and your mind. Most people feel that uh, they're still back in the old days where a hammer and a, a screwdriver is all you need to work on the car, so you don't realize what kind of technology has developed over the years. And the more we know, the quicker we can serve them. The technician's job of the future is going to be a good job. It's going to be a nice, clean, white coat job, uh, high technology, computerization. Repair of the vehicle isn't going to be a big issue, it's going to be just properly diagnosing the problem to begin with. There are over 250 models on the road right now and staying in step with all that technology is becoming increasingly expensive. What we might see in the future is the dealerships handling the bulk of the work, the larger franchises getting the runoff, and the small independent garages like this scrambling for survival. Keeping up is a big problem, there's no doubt about it. On the part of the independents, it takes a monstrous amount of commitment both in dollars and in time. I don't know if they can afford all that. As far as being polarized, the, uh, the car manufacturers have already stated that they cannot fix, basically speaking, what they, what they sell. There's just too many of them. 
they need us to do the, the job to keep their customers happy so they keep coming back to buy their cars. Five, ten years from now, I see us being able to uh, program our own computer for the car, being able to actually make running changes in the car. Uh, we can do a little bit of that now. A lot of two-way communications, us being able to talk to the cars and them being able to quote-unquote talk back. Uh, that technology changes almost monthly. Five years from now, it could almost be scary. Trunk space a problem? Can't get another glove in the glove box? Or are you just a slob? The backseat organizer and storage handler has more pockets than your average leisure suit. Just strap it on under your headrest and start filling it. With five pockets, you should be able to solve your storage problems. This new Acura Legend looks pretty much like last year's Acura Legend, and I'll tell you why next on Kenzie's Corner. Kenzie's Corner with Jim Kenzie. When the original Acura Legend was introduced back in 1987, it was a very nice car and it was well received. Now, there were some complaints about soft suspension and, and poor steering feel and weak bottom end acceleration. But now, just four years later, this all new car specifically addresses those concerns. Now the four year product cycle is typical of Japanese cars and it's driven largely by their home market. In Japan, they tend to buy a new car every three to four years, and they insist on something that's new and different, both to look at and to drive. But the four-year product cycle also has its drawbacks. We can illustrate that by looking at cars built by this car company. Now, Mercedes-Benz tends to have a product cycle of eight to ten years. This gives their engineers a chance to constantly refine the product without necessarily reinventing the wheel. From a resale point of view, it's comforting to know that if you buy a Mercedes today, it won't be instantly obsolete tomorrow. Part of that is due to the fact that this front end could only be a Mercedes. There's a constant family resemblance in all Mercedes models. Now the new legend looks quite a bit like the old legend, but still that front end could be from just about any car. And that represents the challenge that faces the Japanese as they move into the higher priced market segments. They need to continue with the engineering innovations that made them famous, and yet they have to establish a strong product identity to improve brand loyalty. Because in the long run, what Honda, Toyota, Nissan, and the rest of them want to do is to charge as much for their cars as Mercedes does. I'm Jim Kenzie. You're looking at what has become a very common sight around the Palm Springs, California area, windmills. Now what these windmills are doing is they are harnessing the wind to produce electricity and it has proven very successful over the years and they are just spreading like mushrooms throughout the desert. See, you never know what you're going to learn on Motoring 91. Well that's it for this week. We want to thank Honda Canada for allowing us to give you a sneak preview of their brand new 1991 Acura Legend and we wish them much success. That's it for now. We'll see you next week though with more stories and more cars on Motoring Motoring 91 is brought to you by Quaker State. The big Q stands for quality. Always has, always will.